Mantukab is called you, Daniela Galmani. You'll see uh, I have a list of um, synonyms. Uh, it's changed quite a bit over time. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So in terms of uh, the contents of this talk, I'll be talking a bit about the classification, uh, the family, Pseudo-Telfusidae, uh, its distribution, uh, not only in Trinidad, but also in Tobago and Venezuela, all the way to Margarita Island. Uh, uh, ecology, reproduction, um, what prior research was done before I decided to get uh, busy in the hills of Trinidad studying it, and then my research goes with your activity patterns, and I, I try not to put too many, uh, I try to make, put a lot of pictures and so on. Uh, and based on my research, I had some recommendations. Some years ago it was, I think, published in the, in the Trinidad Guardian. I don't think anything was done about it. Uh, the problem with research like this, of course, is that it's, it, it sometimes operates in a vacuum where, you know, UE doesn't disperse the, the materials, so I was trying to get it out to the public. But there's also a dearth of information on what sort of socio-economic, you know, uh, impact this particular species has. Because it is important to some carpenters, okay, as a source of income. So that's also a part of the research that's missing that should be filled in. And of course, hopefully, uh, I'll you know, get enough time to question. So in terms of classification, of course, it's a crab we're talking about. I'm not going to go through each of these, but you can see um, Crustacea, Malacostraca, Necropoda, Brachyura, uh, Pseudothelfusoidea, um, Pseudothelfusidae, genus Eudaniella, and species Garmani. And in terms of synonymy, you can see that the, the name has changed quite a few times. Um, actually, I'm kind of hoping that it's still Eudaniella Garmani because I'll be honest with you, I didn't find any updated name for it. Perhaps Mike might be better able to tell you. I haven't no, got I into the crowds quite so much yet. No. I think it's still Eudaniella Garmani. It'll probably change in a few years again. Um, they can't decide on a name for this particular species, apparently. So the Pseudothelfusidae, the family itself, there's about 229 species. There's three of these that have been found on continental islands. Um, we actually have two of them here. We have uh, Eudaniella Garmani, we have Microthelfusa odelke. That one, however, was recorded, I think, once from El Cerro de la Rico. So if you're all looking for a, uh, an expedition to go and look for a species, perhaps that, that might be a good thing to check out. I don't think it's been recorded more than once. Um, they occupy the headwaters of rivers, and they're sometimes found in, um, in water bodies of valleys quite distant from river mouths, and we'll go into a bit of the ecology as to why that is. They occupy a wide range, okay? You'll notice them down in Chagramas, they're down in so southern Trinidad. Um, I did an Earthwatch project <laughs> with this particular species, they're in Tobago and Castara and Englishman's Bay, they're, they're, they're quite widespread. In terms of the distribution of the species as, as to how they became distributed at where they are in terms of the family distribution, uh, the first, the, the species arose actually, it's theorized in, in, of all places, Puerto Rico. And then there was this Pliocene land bridge. Um, and they eventually got down into South America. And then the King's Lake type tribe uh, distributed from there. And with the um, Place to seen land bridge, they got on to Trinidad, and that's where that's how we got you, Daniela Gama today. In terms of their range, this is uh, as of now where they've been found. So we have them on Margarita Island, uh, on this range in Venezuela, uh, and in all of the ranges in Trinidad, as well as in the north, in the um, in the uh, forest reserve of Tobago. And I did some research on the northern coast of Tobago. So in terms of description, they're quite large crabs. They're, they're classified as land crabs. Uh, but the carapace width, the thickness of the carapace, you can see the carapace is a lot, uh, of about 100 millimeters. It's flattened dorsal ventrally. That's because they, of course, you know, like to get under rocks and so on. The cervical grooves on the carapace are quite distinct. Um, almost continue to the lateral margin. I'll show you a picture of that as well. Calipeds are unequal inside the claws, uh, more so in the male when they're fully developed. Uh, so of course, 
if you've ever noticed hermit crabs and not hermit crabs, sorry, um, what do you call them? Mud crabs and so on. You, they have a, a really large claw. They have heterochili, and that one is used for signaling and so on. So it's similar in this species. They use it to try to attract mates, right? The cleopods of female are very stout and paw like, and again, that has something to do with the ecology, which I'll go into uh, in a little bit. And the cleopods are, if you look underneath <coughs> the abdomen, um, they're these cleopods. If you, the best way to think of a, of a crab in terms of its biology is it being a compressed shrimp. So if you, if you look at a, a shrimp, for example, you'll see these little swimmerets under its abdomen. So if you take that entire abdomen and you shove it underneath the, the thorax, that's basically what a crab is. So it's all of those little swimmerets are like the cleopods um, in the crab. Okay. So in terms of color, they can be easily identified in terms of their life stage from a color transition. They go from being dark brown and intermediate, and of course the, the juveniles are going to be quite small, so then you can identify them as being uh, a juvenile manicu crab. Intermediates are reddish brown, and the adults are this chestnut, chestnut brown with this very distinct H-shaped groove that you find on the carapace itself. Okay? So it's white or off-white, as is their ventral surface. These are a bit uh, bleached of their nice color, but you'll get an idea of what they look like. All right, so here we have you, Daniela Garmani. Um, you can see the heterochili, this, this claw is a lot bigger than this one. Uh, you can see this very distinct a shaped groove that goes almost to the margin of the carapace. So I'm talking about carapace and talking about the carapace there. Um, I do have a picture of the pleopods of the female in a later slide. So the ecology of this species, it was relatively well studied uh, before um, my research, but it's, it's classified as a freshwater land crab. It's found at these high elevations. That said, um, if you're in Tobago and you go into, you know, Castara or one of those places, you just have to go up the streams a little ways and you'll find them. So. Um, they exhibit this dichotomous seasonal cycle, so they're less conspicuous during the dry, the, during the dry season. Um, it's thought that they may undergo some sort of state, uh, state of estivation during this dry season. Uh, they seem to forage actively over mountainsides during the rainy season and, and such. And, they're so-called uh, rain crabs as well. If you're ever taking a, a drive along the Arima Blanchichers Road, when it's raining, you'll see these running all over the place, crossing the road. You might see a few crab hunters walking down with crocus bags full of them as well. Right. They're voracious predators. Okay, they've been observed eating prawns, fish, snakes, insects, and each other. There's, of course, a, a change in um, feeding ecology over time, so there are um, the, in, the juveniles will eat insects and so on, and then they have a much more varied diet um, as they go. In terms of them eating each other, when I was doing my research, I learned that the hard way because I went collecting crabs to measure them and so on, and I ran out of containers, so I said, well, I'll just put them all in to one bucket, and you know, I'm going right there to the car. It's about maybe 10 minutes away from the car, and they had ripped each other apart by the time I got to the car, so they, they really don't like one another. Um, there have also, also been reports of them eating fledgling uh, birds, that, you know, birds that fall out of nests, so uh, bats as well, uh, young bats. So they, they have a really varied diet. Um, and because of that, they, are, they undoubtedly play a really important part in, in rainforest, in, in perhaps rainforest, but especially stream dynamics, okay, because they may be one of the apex predators in these streams, all right? So in terms of what eats them, besides us, um, there have been reports of teras, uh, Digetus marsupialis, the maniku, of course. Some people actually argue that that's why they're called maniku crabs. I personally don't think so, but perhaps. And then they have the, the crab-eating pork, right? Okay, so reproduction is where this species is really special, okay? The reason it's really special is because most crabs are dependent on the sea to complete their life cycle. Okay, they need to, if you, have, if you know of the, the, Christmas red, uh, the, the Christmas Island red crabs, they're these huge migrations of them, you know, you've seen the National Geographic pictures of, of them crossing roads and so on and getting crushed by cars. 
because they're migrating to the sea to, the, to release uh, eggs and so on. These are special because they're completely independent of the sea. Okay, so they make a really interesting evolutionary uh, species in terms of finding out well how would animals, how do animals transition from life in the sea or life in an aquatic environment to become independent of the sea, right? So they lay a small number of large eggs, about 200 to 300. These are about 300, uh, 3 millimeters in diameter. They hatch directly within the pouch of the female, and that's why I think they're called manicure crab. Um, and they retain in there until their first molt, and I have some nice pictures of the young crab. Um, a March to April breeding season has been postulated, but females with young have been seen well into the rainy season. And I also did take note of any gravid or females with young when I did these activity pattern surveys. So uh, it appears, to be honest with you, that there doesn't, there doesn't really appear to be a, a set breeding season for this species. At least none that I could discern. So here we have the really, really young ones. These are the ones that are basically just hat. So you can see the yolk, the yolks are still kind of attached to them. They're really yellow. And this, these are young, this is a dead female that I found with young still. Um, so this is, these are young that have not undergone their first molt as yet. Okay? And you can see these really large, all like pleopods. Okay? If you've ever uh, picked up a female manicure crab and opened up the abdomen, you'll see this, they're these really stout, all like pleopods. And that's to hold the eggs in as well as to support these young, okay? And because they have them in this pouch, they're, you know, basically like marsupials, in a sense. In terms of their economic importance, it's, it's one of three main species, uh, edible land crabs in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, there may be more now because they're probably eating out all the cardosoma. Um, but others are the ironback, cardosoma, and Huey, everyone knows that, ironback or the blueback. Right? And the other one, the hairy crab, you see these cordatas, uh, both belonging to the hairy crab cyanid family. And both of those, you know, are near the sea and depend upon the sea. They're used in many local dishes, of course, including crab and up the cow. Uh, few people told me that that's, you know, this is the tastiest crab, maybe because it's found in the, in the freshwater streams away from the sea and so on. I don't know, uh, to be honest with you. Maybe we should have a taste test or something. Uh, but one thing that's alarming about, about uh, these species is they, they play very, you know, these two especially play very important roles in, in mangrove ecosystems. And these are being mercilessly hunted. There, there's a new hunting method as of late where uh, fishermen just seem to set nets along the banks of like a, a, a mangrove stream as it were, and they just wait till the crabs come out and and the crabs just get completely tangled. And uh, there's no decision, discerning as to size or whatever. They just, they just catch anything, right? So prior research, there's been extensive research done on respiratory physiology by Rodriguez and by Innes. I have those references at the end if you'd like to get those, or just shoot me an email and I could send that to you. Um, the respiratory system is thought to be as complex as the lungs of vertebrates uh, such as lizards and geckos while it still retains its skills. And because it has this highly vascularized, kind of developed uh, lung as it were, um, that's why it's able to run over the mountainsides during periods of rainfall and so on and disperse that way. There was an earthwatch project in Tobago uh, which found the crabs to reach sexual matur maturity at an unusually large size. And that had serious implications for life history strategy and conservation measures. So when I did the Earthwatch project way back in 1999, this is one of the things they wanted to look at and were not able to look at. So I got interested in you know, find, trying to find out um, some of the basic biology in terms of the uh, age at you know the, the age at which they became reproductively uh, active and so on, which is just you know common sense. If it's an exploited species, it's something that you should know. Okay, in order to set maybe limits on the size that you should be catching them and so on. Oops, sorry, pointing. <laughs> All right, so the objectives of my particular study were to determine the growth rates of the crabs in a lab environment. The problem with land crabs is that even if you were to try to use 
marks and so on underneath the carapace. It, you, it, it's so thick you can't actually see those marks. So you can't follow individuals over time in the field. You could use something like pit tags, perhaps, but I did not have the resources for pit tags, so the next best, best thing is to raise them in a lab environment, which is not ideal, admittedly, but that's what it is. Um, to determine the age of maturity and size at maturity of the crabs, determine the breeding season of the crabs through those activity pattern surveys, determine seasonal activity patterns of the crabs, and finally to formulate recommendations for the effective management of this species. So in terms of field methods for the growth, I had field collection for laboratory growth analysis. So I had to go collect crabs. Most of the, those crabs came solely from Maracas Valley because it was really nice and convenient to go to um, go there from UWE. Uh, and these were actually raised in, in a lab environment. Uh, in terms of maturity, any female under 30 millimeters carpets with and males were measured for relative growth analysis in the field. <laughs> but those females that were over 30 millimeters carpets with uh, were taken back to the lab for histological analysis of the ovary and those crabs were taken from Maracas, Arima, Guanapo, and the Arepa Valley sites. And in terms of activity patterns, I did field activity surveys uh, uh, fortnightly at the El Naranjo uh, stream sites in the Arepa Valley, and those were every those were fortnightly for an entire year between 11:30 p.m. and 1 a.m. It, it got lonely up there at night, but I never had to fight for a research vehicle, so that was nice. Very few people wanted to do night work. So this is just a quick and dirty sketch of where my study sites were. They were all in Northern Rain, of course, for logistic purposes. So there's Maracas Valley there, the Rima River, uh, there's the Guanapo River. Those are more collection sites. And then the Arepo River was where I did these activity uh, pattern surveys. This is the setup in the lab. This was my home for Roughly two years. Each of these contained one crab each because they like to eat one another, so I couldn't keep them together. And uh, I basically had to change the water once or twice a week using stream water from Maracas Valley, trying to keep it as natural as possible. Um, of course, you do what you can when you're trying to look at growth in a, in a lab environment. So in terms of some of the measurements I made, here we have, uh, this, is a, this is a nice color of uh, uh, the mannequin crab. So uh, we, did, we had carcass with uh, propodus depth, propodus length, both, both of the major and the minor caliped. Uh, propodus breadth, the abdomen width, very important in female crab. And the leg four meris length, um, just to get an idea of uh, of, a, of a, a piece of the crab, basically that you shouldn't really see any sort of change in allometric growth, ne uh, positive or, or negative. So, in terms of the growth analysis, there were about 120 moles observed during lab growth. Uh, Egamani, like most other crabs. Went, underwent the same four main stages. So you have the pre molt proecdysis, the molt ecdysis, post molt metagdysis, and the intermolt period. Intermolt, of course, is when the crab is basically running around eating things and doing that sort of thing. So the pre uh, showed some distinctive characteristics. You'd see that the exoskeleton would get kind of worn. Uh, remember, these are land crabs, so they have to invest quite a lot of energy into their exoskeleton. It's quite thick compared to some of the other crabs. If you've caught a, a Kalanectes um, Siri, you'd realize it's kind of soft sometimes. These were really hard, you know, shells. Uh, crab was seen in the water more often than usual during uh, pre molt so you could actually tell when the crabs were about to molt a lot of the time. Uh, the crab would stop feeding, which was a really, really indicative sign that it, would, it was about to molt. Carcass uh, would separate from the first abdominal segment at the back. And then, you know, I'd, I'd leave for the day and it, I'd come back and there'd be a freshly molded crab, basically. So this is just a, a graph showing you how 
extreme defeating change. So you see the general, it's just a general trend I want to show you. The, you see that the defeating would decline, and then you have ecdysis where it'll just basically not, not feed at all. And then right after they get really hungry once again when they're trying to build back up their shells, right? So, um, so you see you know, quite a spike in terms of the feeding. During ecdysis, the crab would always molt in water. And of course, water provides buoyancy. It gives the crab a little bit more support. Um, crab withdrew from the old carapace in about three to five hours. And the recently molted crab would remain within water. And during metagysis, the crab would remain in water for some time, consume its exuvium, or old carapace, and the carapace would change color from pale brown to dark brown. So it hardens after, after a while. Right? So here's a newly molted crab. Right? That's its old shell, so you can see the crack that happened along the back here. It actually exits out the back. And this is one getting a little bit darker. You can see that the shell is that the, the, uh, the shell is starting to get a bit harder, so you've seen some color coming back in. Most land crabs actually eat the old exuvium to save calcium and so on, so this is, the, this is it chowing down on its old uh, exuvium there. And just, you can see once again that it's getting darker still as, as time passes. So in terms of absolute growth in new Daniela Gamani, so that, that was me just talking about what I did in the lab, but from those experiments, I was actually able to get growth increment data, which is the increase in size occurring at a given mold, and the intermode period, which is the time period between two successive modes. So I got 120 growth increment values, basically, and about, I think, 99 intermode periods to base the growth equations on. So the growth increment is expressed as a percentage by which, by which the post mode exceeds the pre mode. Uh, here is just two graphs showing you females on top. So of course we get a general decline in growth increment in both of the males and females. I just put a, a, a line in there to kind of show the general trend. All right. Uh, compared to other species, they tended to have higher growth increments than many land crab species. And that's probably because they spend a lot of time in water as well. So they're not strictly land crabs like um, uh, Cardosoma. The intermolt is expressed as the number of days between one molt and the other, as I said. Uh, it's more difficult to get, of course, because you have to hope that a crab survives in the lab for two successive molts in order to get that. Uh, and of course, there may be a bit more unreliable results because the crabs have kept for a longer time under these unnatural conditions. So I got approximately 99 of those. And this, this basically shows increasing intermolt period with increasing size class, which you might expect. Uh, crabs take 14 molts to reach about 70 millimeters. There's a steep departure from the trend in, in the females in the higher size classes. Not really that obvious in the males. Okay, but what this is indicative of is perhaps the commencement of maturity in the female crabs. And I was able to make these growth curves using this data. Um, so, of course, you'd always want more data, but this is what I had to work with. So these are female crabs. So you can, you can see from the cumulative intermolt period that if we're looking at an estimate of how long it might take for these crabs to reach 70 millimeters, it takes about 1,000 days. Okay, so that's, I mean, that's seven millimeters is like that. A thousand days is roughly about two and a half years. So it takes a really long time for them to reach that size. And that's typical of, of a lot of land crabs because they have to invest so much more into this carapace. So the crabs appear to be long lived as suspected in the Earthwatch project. Uh, roughly three years for the females to reach 69 millimeters. A uh, thousand days or you know, roughly two and a half, two, two and three quarters, sorry, to reach 66 millimeters. And field data on absolute growth is needed to confirm the laboratory growth analysis. So if any of you knows anybody with some pit tags that we could probably borrow and stick in some crabs and then track them down to investigate, that may be something to look into. In terms of relative growth, relative growth occurs when certain dimensions increase at rates different from others, 
which gives the car a forming change in proportion with size. And that's usually much more pronounced in those, those structures that are directly or indirectly related to reproduction. So in the males, that's probably going to be the kelly beds, right? In the females, as you'll see, that's going to be the abdomen. And the abdomen, of course, has to grow to accommodate these young, the eggs and the young. Uh, I won't go into the allometry equation too much, but uh, the variable dimension is going to be uh, like your caliped length or caliped width or your abdomen width, for example. The reference dimension I always kept as a carapace width. And of course, then you have the intercept and the regression coefficient. And this is a, a really good picture to show you guys what the change looks like in a female abdomen of this species. So this is a juvenile here, and you can see it kind of widens with age. Okay, it gets much broader. Right? So these crabs are, of all crabs, it's really easy to tell which one is female, which one's, which one's male. Okay, the male is basically just stays kind of triangular in shape. If you turn it over, female is going to get nice and broad. So if you were to actually put some restriction on what you were catching in the field, it would make sense to just have crab hunters turn over the crab, take a quick diagnostic check if it's, if it's a female or male, and if it's a female, put it back. Just my suggestion, but anyway. In terms of relative growth analysis, I did breakpoint analysis, levels of allometry uh, analysis to find out whether or not it's positive or negative allometry with particular measurements, and analysis of covariance to see whether or not there was a difference between uh, males and females and between um, the lab measured specimens and the field measured specimens. Because then I could kind of check whether or not you know, what I was doing in the lab was reasonable. So the breakpoint analysis um, is typically, uh, typically used to determine morphometric maturity in crabs. In many species, you have two types of maturity. You have morphometric maturity, which is where the structures become mature to accommodate reproduction. And you have functional maturity, which is when they can actually produce eggs. Right? I used piecewise linear regression um, to determine whether or not there was any breakpoints. And I found breakpoints in the abdomen of females and in the major propodus of males and in none of the other measurements, basically. And based on this, separate allometric equations can be applied to each portion of those breakpoints, okay, to compare them. So, just to give you an idea, uh, the breakpoint uh, for the male propodus length is at 39.41. Uh, well, it's better if I show you the, the figures, I think. Uh, but the important thing to recognize here is that the males would have one break point with their um, claws, with the major claw, not with the minor claw. So you can tell when they're becoming functionally mature, um, uh, morphometrically mature. The females have two break points, and that's easily seen in these figures here. So, so this is the male major propodus hair breaking break point hair. So it's going along nicely and then all of a sudden it, it shoots up. In the females, it stays pretty much similar. Okay, you don't really get a significant change. In the female abdomen, this is the one that's most profound. You get this break point lower down at around 40 millimeters, which is morphometric maturity beginning. Morphometric maturity ceases at about maybe uh, 70 millimeters and then it kind of slows down again. And of course, the abdomen of the male, you'll see, it just, it just stays constant. And as expected, with something like the minor propodus, you don't really see that much change. I mean, this was really profound. I mean, I didn't even expect this. Males and females both lying directly on top of each other, basically. Um, I won't talk too much about the ANCOVA results, but ANCOVA basically tests the significant differences between the uh, growth increments and so on. Uh, sorry, the, the measurements of these different uh, parts of the crab. So most of the ANCOVA tests of the female major propodus showed no significant difference, whereas that of the male did. So you're seeing that there's a significant difference between that male propodus in terms of um, growth. Abdomen and probe test showed significant differences in female data, but not in the male, which you would expect. Uh, minor propodus and left leg like, formaris length 
uh, no significant difference. And these are not really uh, involved in the reproductive aspects of the crab. So this is in keeping with what you might expect. Finally, to lend credence to what I was doing in the lab, because whenever anybody hears that I'm trying to model growth in the lab and compare it to what might happen in the wild, 11 of the 16 data comparisons between the laboratory and the field data showed no significant difference, which kind of lends a little bit of credence to what I was doing in the lab. Not great, but still. In terms of functional maturity, this is where we were looking at the ovaries and so on of the female crabs. So it's defining the size of which female crabs are sexually mature. Though crabs may have undergone structural maturity, it's important to realize that they might not be sexually mature. So if you're collecting crabs below functional maturity, it makes absolutely no sense. Right? Because you're still collecting crabs before they've had a chance to reproduce. And gross examination of the ovaries and histological analysis of the ovaries was done to determine uh, their sexual maturity. Uh, there was a distinct color change in the crabs that I uh, unfortunately had to tear apart and get the ovaries out. Um, below 30, 30 millimeters, they're very inconspicuous. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's really difficult to even find them. Between 30 and 69, the ovaries were translucent, translucent turning into white. And beyond 69 millimeters, they're white, pale yellow, bright yellow, or orange. Um, and that, that process, that the process that they undergo is termed vitellogenesis, where you're getting um, these yolk building type cells developing within the ovary. And this, this graph here kind of shows a distinct pattern color change. So this ovary weight, this is characteristic with A of a nice straight line. It of course extends beyond where you might expect uh, sexual maturity to occur because some of these mature crabs would have ovaries that weren't um, that weren't producing eggs at a, at a particular time. But there's a really a distinct line that's kind of drawn here. You see it's, it just becomes completely disorganized after that. So at about 70 millimeters is where I would estimate that this crab becomes sexually mature. Okay, at least a female. Once again, um, in terms of ovarian cell size, you see that scatter again. And in terms of a summary of the maturity analysis, Structural maturity begins at about 47 millimeters in males. It begins at 42 millimeters and ends at about 67 millimeters in females. And functional or sexual maturity in females begins at about 69 millimeters carapace width based on this examination of ovaries. So what you're finding is it's, it was actually quite a neat pattern. So as the morphometric maturity ceases, it perhaps something switches in the crab's biology, and then the functional maturity begins. So up to 70 millimeters is kind of where you want to set your harvest size. In terms of activity patterns, I didn't really find any discernible pattern with the intermediates and the adults, but with the juveniles, uh, they were much more active after the peaks. These, were, these coincided with peak months of rainfall, okay, for that particular year. And in terms of when this species is actually, um, when the breeding season is and so on, I honestly couldn't tell you because these are all gravid, gravid females, which you know, looks, it looks like it's pretty much across the entire year. And I actually found females with young um, into December, there's a gap there, but throughout into April, uh, and I would imagine I just didn't spot some of them in there. So with that, I had some recommendations. Common form of management, like I said before, is to set a minimum legal size of capture uh, based on sexual maturity, right? And I found out that sexual maturity is at 70 millimeters. So I'm saying that, okay, if it's 70 millimeters, let's give the crabs at least one chance to mate. And that's 75 millimeters about there, 70, 75 to 80. And since there's no uh, since there's no reproductive season found, um, any gravid females or females bearing young should not be exploited. That's just common sense, but of course, you always hear reports of, of people just picking up whatever they can, dumping it into a crocus bag, and you know, an entire generation is kind of wiped out. 
Uh, more research needs to be done regarding the socioeconomic implications of setting a minimum legal size of capture, because that was outside of the scope of my research. But what, you should, what should be done is um, we need to, mo need to know more about the biology, but at the same time we need to know, well, how much crabs are crab hunters collecting out of the wild? How much money are they getting per year? If we set this minimum legal size, how is that going to affect them economically? Okay, because you don't want to do anything in a vacuum. And then more research needs to be done on reproductive biology and respiratory physiology of the species. It's a very, it's a really cool species. We're lucky to have it. Hopefully we'll have it for a lot more time because I think there's a lot of mountains in the northern range that people just can't get to to crab, to crab hunt kind of thing. Um, but I've heard reports, for example, around um, is a right and so on, where they've seen a marked decline in the number of crabs that they see because people just, you know, as soon as rain falls, at the beginning of the rainy season, they run up there and, and collect a whole bunch of crabs. Uh, some references, if um, I can send a reference list for this particular species if y'all are interested. And um, finally, not that I want to be aggressive or anything, but I thought this was a really cool picture. If you have any questions, I'll take them now. I can't.